discard than anthropocentrism. For centuries, many of our ancestors had convinced themselves that the Earth sat at the center of the universe and that the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars all revolved around it, around us. Then Copernicus, almost 500 years ago, kicked off the scientific revolution by asserting that it was the Earth that revolved around the sun, not the other way around. Our world was just one of the planets. But geocentrism merely gave way to heliocentrism. Because if the Earth isn't at the center of the universe, then the Sun must be, right? Forty years after Copernicus, Giordano Bruno proposed that our solar system was not at the center of the universe, but was just one among countless other star systems. The Catholic Church burned him at the stake in 1600. In 1905, Albert Einstein published his special theory of relativity, which incorporated the principle of relativity originated by Galileo and utilized by Isaac Newton, and stated that space and time are inextricably linked and that there is no such thing as a privileged frame of reference. Since everything in the universe is in motion relative to something, there is no center for us to occupy. In the 1930s, thanks to the work of Robert Julius Trumpler, astronomers were finally able to accurately describe the size and shape of our own Milky Way galaxy. This is the most current depiction. There's the sun right there, just one of many stars in one of several spiral arms far from the center. And it turns out there's nothing that special about our galaxy either. In the 1920s and 30s, astronomers like Haber Curtis, Ernst Oeppig, and Edwin Hubble demonstrated that many objects then referred to as nebulae, like the Great Andromeda Nebula, were too far away to have been part of the Milky Way and were in fact separate galaxies, composed, like ours, of billions and billions of stars. Since then, we've discovered and classified thousands of galaxies and found evidence to suggest that there are over 170 billion galaxies in the observable universe. And as this Hubble picture of NGC 1300 shows, lots of them are just as beautiful as our galaxy, too. The beauty of the fine-tuning argument to a creationist is that it brings it all back around to us, even in the face of this overwhelming evidence of our cosmic insignificance. Okay, so we live on one of eight planets, orbiting an ordinary star in the boondocks of an unremarkable galaxy, less than a speck in an unfathomably vast universe. Ah, the creationist says, but all of that magnificent vastness was created with us in mind. So long as there are humans, anthropocentrism never dies. There are naturalistic explanations proposed for the apparent fine-tuning of the universe. For instance, there's the postulation of a multiverse, which would place our universe as just one of many coexisting parallel to one another. There's Stephen Hawking's idea of top-down cosmology, which is way too complicated for me to even begin to understand, let alone explain. There's the idea that our universe may have been designed by some alien intelligence, which existed or still exists outside of its boundaries. And there's always the possibility that the physical constants came to their current values by legitimate random chance, that we really are just that lucky. But even these proposed scientific explanations get it backwards, I think. The principle of Occam's razor teaches us to prefer a simple explanation that accounts for all the facts over a more complicated one. Now, the universe being fine-tuned to our needs sounds like a simple explanation at first, but it gets complicated real fast when you have to start accounting for how it got to be fine-tuned. Isn't it far more likely that we are fine-tuned to the universe? This is an insect of the order Phasmatidea. Where I'm from, we call them walking sticks, or stick bugs. This insect lives in trees, typically, and eats leaves for food. When it keeps still, which it does for most of the day, only becoming active at night, it is visually indistinguishable from a twig. It is superbly camouflaged. 
Even its eggs are camouflaged to resemble seeds. Is that stick bug so well suited to its environment because that environment was designed with it in mind? Of course not. People used to believe the same thing about us and our environment, but that was before Charles Darwin and the scientists who succeeded him demonstrated that it was the other way around. Life adapts to its environment. If the environment in that photograph were different, if it were, say, a deep sea hydrothermal vent, there wouldn't be a stick bug there, but there might be a tube worm or an octopus. That'd be cool. Stick bugs are not the only possible form of life, and their habitat is not the only possible environment. Why should we presume any differently about life as we know it in general, or the universe? It's true. If the fundamental physical constants were not pretty close to their actual values, carbon molecules couldn't form, and life as we know it would not exist. But who's to say some other form of life? a form allowable under those conditions would not arise. It's true that if the fundamental physical constants were very different from their present values, there would be no stars or galaxies. But so what? We have no way of knowing what might exist in a universe with physical constants very different from our own. Not stars or galaxies, but maybe something that the intelligent inhabitants of that universe, if they exist, found just as enchanting as we find the stars. This may well be the only universe in which our form of life can exist, but that doesn't make ours the only possible form of life, or this the only possible universe. And anyway, as well adapted as we might be to our various habitats, none of us are perfectly adapted, even that stick bug. Which is fine. It's what we would expect, actually, from a natural process like evolution. Natural selection doesn't result in perfection. It results in fitness. It doesn't give us stuff that works perfectly. It gives us stuff that works. Now take a look at the universe. Most of it is far too cold, too dark, and too lacking in essentials like water and oxygen for our form of life to exist. In fact, the only place in the whole wide universe we've ever found where our form of life can live is right here on our tiny little planet orbiting our average star in an out-of-the-way neighborhood of our ordinary galaxy. Does that sound like a universe that has been fine-tuned for us? We, and in a way, stars and galaxies, are adapted to the universe. We aren't fine-tuned to it, and it certainly isn't fine-tuned to us. If it looks that way at first, well, what else do we expect? The structures and life forms we observe seem adapted to the universe because this is where they're from. We aren't just in the universe. We're of the universe. We're well adapted to it because if we weren't, we wouldn't be here. We didn't need a god to fine-tune everything to us. We did it all by ourselves, without even realizing we were doing it. Carl Sagan called us a way for the cosmos to know itself. We began, we think, as primitive self-replicating organic molecules and evolved over billions of years from single-celled organisms into thinking, feeling, reasoning animals capable of perceiving and struggling to understand the universe around us. We experiment, we observe, we investigate things that we don't understand. We theorize, we propose explanations, we formulate arguments to defend those explanations against those who think they have a better idea. Some of those arguments, like, say, those in support of the Big Bang, or special and general relativity, or evolution through common descent, have proven persuasive, and the ideas that they represent have been accepted widely as important parts of human knowledge. Other arguments have been disproven a thousand different ways and are no longer taken seriously by most people. And yet still other arguments, like the argument for a fine-tuned universe, are inherently compelling, but have been flogged so long and so often that any persuasive power they once held is long gone. And now, 
I'm just tired of hearing them.